All right, so we just read there the entire chapter of Proverbs chapter 1, and as it starts off, the, you know, we know that the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom, it's a book for gaining understanding, and it's, you know, it starts off to know wisdom. Well, so for the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, verse number 1, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity. All of these things are good things. It's just being very wise, very, being very knowledgeable, getting um, enlightened, if you will, and, and just gaining more and more understanding, getting smart, being wise, understanding justice, understanding judgment, understanding equity. Equity is what's right, what's equal, knowing right from wrong. It says to give subtlety to the simple. Simple is kind of a nice way of saying someone who's kind of stupid, right? Someone who's not very intelligent or not very bright. Giving subtlety to the simple is giving them a deeper understanding, giving them more meaning, giving them um, a better understanding. To, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Discretion is, again, being able to determine right from wrong. A wise man will hear and will increase learning and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. And, you know, none of us is ever beyond continuing to learn and gain more wisdom and learn more. Don't ever get to the place where you think like, well, yeah, I know it all. I mean, we, we come across these people. Oh, I know what the Bible says, right? You go out soul wedding. Oh, yeah, I've read the Bible. I know what the Bible says. And they don't even know how to be saved. And they don't even know like, like people you reference or anything like that. It's like, oh, yeah, but I know the Bible. That's a dangerous attitude to have. I mean, it's kind of funny to us. It's comical because it's like you don't know anything about the Bible at all. I mean, you, don't, you can't say that you know the Bible when you don't even know, like, who Abraham is, right? Or you, you know, you've never heard of Jacob. I, I find that most of those people that say, I know the Bible, I've read it, know what other people say about it. That. Exactly. That's right. They're, they're relying on, and, and the vast majority of people do. They rely on what other people say even those that don't just say, oh, yeah, I know the Bible. Many of them do. Many people say, oh, I know the Bible. They just have heard someone that they like say something about the Bible, and that's, that's what they know about it. But unfortunately today, there are a lot of even just well-meaning believers, people who do believe the Bible and are saved, but they just go off of what someone else says still. And they're not getting God's word for themselves and reading and getting to know the Bible. Getting to know God's word, hearing God's word, receiving instruction, getting wisdom. Now, we know the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. I mean, this is kind of what's dedicated to you. You get a lot of topics that are real just fundamental, basic foundational principles, you know, concepts of adultery and fornication and, you know, stealing and just doing things right. You know, all of these concepts are found in this book and it's kind of dedicated to all these real simple life principles. But it's not, wisdom is not just um, segregated into this one book of the Bible. All of God's word provides knowledge and wisdom and will give you this understanding and get you to know God more and to know what God's will is in your life and to know the thing to know right from wrong and to help you to understand to know to make every single decision in your life is going to come from the wisdom found in this book. So I'm, when we're reading this, understand it's, we're not just referring to the book of Proverbs. We're referring to all of God's words, his holy words. What, think about this. I mean, the creator of everything, the creator of this earth, the creator of the universe, everything that exists, the wisdom that God has to make everything function the way that it does, to make our bodies work the way that it does and to self-heal and to do all these things. At the, I mean, it's, it's amazing. You could go into any aspect, any area of creation and just glory in, in how magnificent it is and how utterly just awesome it truly is. And a God that made all of these things decided to give us information and knowledge and to reveal 
his words unto us. So everything that God has decided was important enough for us to have contained in a book is found in this Bible. And we ought to treat it very precious. It's, it's, it's a very uh, important thing. It's something that we should value very highly and not just give lip service to and say, yeah, I believe the Bible, but treat it as something that the God of the universe gave to us and this is how we hear from God. This is how we do it. Too many people, see, it, it, it's work to do this. And what people want to do, they just want to hear an audible voice. They want to have a vision. They want to hear from God in some other way. Because they don't want to just sit down and be like, oh yeah, I've already read the Bible. That's boring. This is where we're going to get our instruction from, from God. He's already done it. He doesn't need to repeat himself to every single person. I mean, think about that. Think about how silly that is that to, to, for God to have to just speak to every, I mean, there's billions of people on this earth. Not that anything's too hard for the Lord, but why should he have to just have communications individually with every single person just uniquely where you're hearing voices and you're, you know, no, he's given it to us. He's given it to everybody for one time. We have it right here. And gaining this wisdom that God has given to us should be of utmost importance to us. Continuing on here in verse number six, the Bible says, um, you know, or verse number five, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. We're always, we should always be looking forward to learning more. If you're already wise, hey, you're going to keep learning. You're going you're gonna to seek after God's word. You're going to seek after more truth and more wisdom. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. I mean, aren't there parts of the Bible, like I think everybody has parts of the Bible they don't quite understand. Don't you want to understand God's word? Amen. I do. Do you know the only way you're really going to do that? Or, or one way you're sure not to understand it is by not reading the Bible. God's given us avenues of, of being able to learn Obviously, he's given preachers and people to help to, to, to clarify parts of the Bible and things like that. However, you are not going to really learn or, or attain knowledge and wisdom on your own if you are not reading the Bible for yourself. If all you do is go to church, if all you do is listen to YouTube videos, if that's all you ever do, you're not going to be wise. You're not going to be that wise. You might pick up some things. But you need to be reading this for yourself. Every sermon you preach is, or you hear preach is, is, is I mean, we try to, I try to put in a lot of Bible and Scripture, but it's hardly anything compared to the whole book. And if you don't even know the context from which a sermon is being derived, you're, you're not going to be able to apply it properly. You need to know what, what these books, you need to know what they are. And look, if you haven't read through the Bible cover to cover, you ought to. And one, if you've done it once, that's not enough. We need to continue and keep this fresh in your mind and go over it and over and over and over and over again because even just reading it once, I mean, some people, I thought maybe they have read the Bible once, but they still don't know the characters. They don't know the people. So they don't know, you know, very much about what it actually says because you've read it once. You've flipped through it once. To gain the maximum wisdom and knowledge, we need to know, we, the, the Bible needs to be very familiar to you. You need to know the people. You need to know the story. You need to know what's being referenced. You need to, to get to understand, you know, if, if there's going to be something taught, like in the New Testament, there's a lot of things taught regarding things that happened in the Old Testament. There's stories that are brought up. There's people who are brought up. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, these people are referenced many times in the New Testament. And the reference in regards to teaching and giving you more wisdom and more understanding. Well, if you don't know those to begin with, your understanding isn't going to be very fruitful. You're not going to have that much understanding when it's referencing something that you don't even know. Say, well, I've only, I only read the New Testament because I don't care. You know, the Old Testament's done. No, you need to read all of it. The Bible says all scripture is profitable for, for instruction, for um, 
correction, and, and I'm totally misquoting that verse. But, um, but this is important. Now, I'm bringing up all this stuff. Why? And, and when you see in the Proverbs, especially in multiple chapters, chapter after chapter, chapter, he's, you know, the, the narrator is speaking to his son. And, my son, receive my instruction. My son, hear my words. Listen to this. This is important. And we need to treat God's word as being that important. And we need to, you need to decide. Obviously, we're coming up on a new year. And this isn't necessarily a whole new year sermon. It's actually just geared on one point, on one topic of reading your Bible. But you need to decide what type of Christian do you want to be in the new year? Do you want to, do you want to just try to coast and just get by? I'll tell you, if, if you have that type of mindset of just this is what I want, because you're looking forward, right? We're going to look forward. What's the new year going to hold? What are my plans? What are my goals? What do I want to do? Well, I really want to focus on work, but just try to maintain and, and coast through the Christian life. I, you know, if you have that mindset on, on the beginning, you are going to backslide. You're not going to, you're not going to be able to maintain. No one's able to just maintain. It's, it's hard. You're either going forwards or you're going backwards. But if you decide to say, you know what, I want to move forward. I want to do a little bit more. I want to do a lot more. I want to really ramp up my service to God. In order to be successful, no matter what your vision is, in order to be successful in 2018 in your Christian life, and even just your Christian life in general, you know, 2018 and beyond, in order for you to be successful, you need to form good habits to where it's a continual thing. And you need to be reading your Bible daily. Every single day of your life, you ought to be hearing and receiving instruction and receiving wisdom from God. This is something that, you know, wisdom doesn't just happen overnight. We don't live in the matrix where you could just plug in and get the, you know, I'm going to download all of this knowledge and just be like, okay, now I know it. Cool. And there's like no work involved to it. That's not reality. That's science fiction. That's not the way everything works. The Bible tells us it's precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. That's how we gain our understanding. We have to just, just dig in, but be consistent with it. See, we, we forget things. If you, if you don't use something, you'll end up losing it. If you, if you get wisdom about something, you get some understanding, and it goes a real long time and you're just not using it, you're not applying it, you're not thinking about it, you're going to forget about it. I mean, this happens, you could just think of regular worldly examples. You know, I think of examples if I've, if I've worked on something in my car, you know, I'm not a mechanic, but I, but I try as much as I can to fix my vehicles and do as much, you know, do things handy. If, and if I haven't done something in a really long time, it's almost like I have to just relearn it all over again. Say, yeah, but you did it a long time. I mean, you did the study, you did the research, you did everything you needed to do, and you got it done. Yeah, I did it a long time ago. But guess what? I've forgotten. That's why you can't just say, oh, yeah, I read the, I read the Bible. I read, you know, I read the Bible, was, you know, 10 years ago. That's not enough. You're gonna, you've forgotten it. You don't even know what it says anymore. It's important. And if you're going to be successful, you need to make this a priority in your life. A lot of people make New Year's resolutions and they get real excited at this time of year. And you know what? It is exciting. And, I, and I'm not against New Year's resolutions. I'm not against people doing that and looking forward to it. I think we ought to. I think it's a good thing to do. I mean, especially in our church after this year, 2017 is a pretty rough year. Let's look to the future. Let's say, okay, let's, we're going to put this behind us. We're going to move forward. We're going to do this. But the only way that anything is going to stick that you want to do is by making it a habit and forming the good habits and having a realistic goal, a realistic vision, not trying to, to, to overshoot, you know, just, just having some crazy goal that there's no way you're ever going to reach. I mean, you notice we had our goals for the new year in the bulletin. I didn't say a thousand salvations. Okay, now is that great? Do I want a thousand salvations? Of course I do. Do I want to see that happen as a church? You bet I do. Are other churches doing that? Of course they are. But not here and not in this town and not with this church. We don't have enough people. We need more manpower. It's just, it's, would to God that we would have this explosion of a bunch of on fire, sold out, Bible believing, you know, people to come and join our church. 
And I'm not going to be upset about that. We can blow away our goals, but you know what? Is that likely to happen? No. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a goal, and it is a goal to push, to do more than what we've done. We didn't reach last year's goal. We fell a little short of that. But we're pushing for even more than last year's goal. Because I know that we can do it, and it's not unrealistic, but there's definitely some things that need to happen, but, but that's going to require the work, and that's what we're focused on. Now, in order to make that happen, we need to make habits and, and consistency to achieve those goals. Okay, And I'm not going to get into all those with the soul winning and everything else, because what I'm focusing on is the Bible reading. You need to have a goal... And, and spell it out. See, too many people don't really think too much about it. Now, at the very, very, very least, make sure you have a goal to read your Bible every day. At, the, at, at an extreme minimum, just something. I mean, be reading God's Word every day. That ought to be something. But I think we can do better than that. I think we could get a little bit more structured than that. I think we could go... And, and actually plan and plan something out for our Bible reading. So this year, just like we did last year, now we did a little bit later in the year last year, we're doing our challenges again this year. Okay, this is going to help us to grow. This is going to help you to grow spiritually and as a church, it's going to help us to grow as well if we can get involved with the various challenges that we're going to be doing. And of course, this month, I'm starting off the new year. A lot of people have goals on reading their Bibles and getting the Bible read. And getting your Bible read cover to cover in one year is a great goal to have. Now, I, again, I personally see that as kind of a minimum of where we should be at. You decide for yourself. But I think, I mean, I think if, if we're not getting through God's word cover to cover within a year, you know, you might want to reconsider that and try to push yourself to do a little bit more. The reason why I say I think it's kind of a minimum is because you can read the Bible cover to cover in a year if you just spent approximately 15 minutes out of your entire day to reading the Bible. If you do approximately four chapters a day, just four chapters a day, that will get you through the entire Bible in a year. Now there's lots of ways, if you have a goal of saying, well, I want to read through the Bible in a year, there's lots of ways to do that. Do whatever way is going to work. I am a fan, personally, of going cover to cover. I, I do believe that there is, there is wisdom in the order that, that the books of the Bible were, were put together that we have. But, I mean, God's Word is still God's Word. And there's ways of breaking it up. You know, you could use four chapters. You say, well, some chapters are longer, some chapters are shorter. You know, and especially when you get to the book of Psalms, a lot of short chapters. Well, you can do pages. Everybody's Bible is different. Just see how many pages of Scripture you have and then divide that by 365. That'll tell you how many pages you should read in a day to get your Bible read in a year. It's pretty simple. See, it's easy math. It's a, see, I'm not good at math. It's easy math to do. It shouldn't take you to get a calculator out, get the total number of pages. My Bible has over 1,000 here, like 1,200. 1,235 pages divided by 365. That's how many pages I need to read in order to get through this Bible in one year. Now, that's talking about for the whole year, our challenge. And, this, and if you have that as a goal, this is going to help you out because our challenge for this month is, to, is for the month of January to read the entire New Testament in 31 days. Okay, that's, that's the goal. That's what I'd like to see people do. And if you're used to maybe only reading your Bible once a year, I mentioned it's approximately four chapters a day, if you read the New Testament in one month, the way that you can do that, and I got all the numbers here, there's 260 chapters in the New Testament. Okay? There's 31 days in January, right? So 260 divided by 31 is 8 point something. I don't remember all the numbers, two, three, whatever. It's, uh, if you, and if you read, so if you read eight chapters per day, because it's a little bit less than what you would need to, you would fall 12 chapters short by the end of the month. But if you read nine chapters per day in the New Testament, nine chapters, 
In 29 days, you'll have 261. So it's one chapter more than there actually is in the New Testament. So you'd have nine chapters a day for, 29, for 28 days and then eight chapters and you're done. And then you have two extra days. So, and, and the reason why I like that, those two days off, if something happens that's just completely out of the ordinary, that's, that's out of your normal schedule, and maybe you don't get all nine chapters read, or maybe you don't get anything read. You don't have to freak out and be like, oh man, now I got to do all this math again. Now I got to figure out how am I going to get this done? Because oftentimes the reason why people fail with goals and with resolutions and things that you want to do is because you do have something, you have something that screws you up, that gets you off schedule, that, that kind of gets you off balance. And then you're just like, oh, I don't know what to do. And then you just kind of end up giving up. Well, the worst thing you can do is give up. Our goal or our challenge is to get this done in one month. But if you get this done in a month and a day or in a month and two days, the benefit's still yours. Okay? If it screws you up, don't just quit. Amen. Keep going. Just, just, just say, okay, well, that happened, but I'm going to make this happen. But, but if you add in, even with that extra little buffer, though, of if you do nine chapters a day, you could say, you know, I could still reach this goal of getting it done in 31 days because I'm just going to keep reading nine. And you know what? Do 10. That'll help you out even more just to make sure you're getting everything in just to meet that goal of 31 days. And just kind of pay attention to where you're at and mark it off and make sure you get it done. But it totally can be done. And we did this last year. I did it last year. I looked to see, I, I, we're, we're out of all the bookmarks. Because again, there's multiple ways of doing this. You can do the same thing with the pages. See how many pages are in your New Testament. Divide it by 31 days and see how many pages you need to read. Um, the chapter thing is, is kind of an easy thing to go off of though. You do nine chapters a day, you're guaranteed to get this done. Now, if you can keep that pace up, I mean, think about that. It'd just be the month of January, New Year, and your whole New Testament will be read. And then all you have left is the Old Testament to read. For the rest of the year, if you were just trying to get the Bible read one time in a year, that's, that's going to make it a lot easier to, for 11 months to get the Old Testament read. But if you can keep up that pace, if you read nine chapters per day, because remember I said about four chapters a day gets your Bible read once in a year, you could read the Bible, you could get your Bible read more than twice in one year by doing nine chapters a day. And again, nine chapters a day, that's close to probably about 30 minutes of your time a day. When you consider the wisdom and the knowledge and how much God's word really will help you in your day-to-day -day life, I mean, it's to your benefit and your advantage to invest that time into receiving God's word. Now, one thing I just want to make clear, and I, I don't want people to just rush through this is one trap that you can fall into of, well, I have to read nine chapters and you're just like, just skimming, you know, trying to do speed reading or something with the Bible. Don't do that because your understanding is going to be unfruitful if you do that. That's not worth it. It's just going to be a waste of your time. Now, I'm not saying you have to just pour over every word, right? Read the Bible, but read it at a normal pace for you. Because everyone's got different... What, you know, reads at different speeds. I don't read extremely fast, but everyone's at, at a different level on your own. And do what you can do to where you're going to understand, you know, what you're reading and do that for your nine chapters. Cause you, because at the end of the day, what you, you want to make sure you're getting it. That's the whole point of reading. The reading isn't done to count words and just be like, okay, cool, I got those words done. You know, give me my prize. That's not, that's not the point. But when you consider how helpful this will be in your own life, just personally, and, and you realize just having God's word in your heart, 30 minutes a day or nine chapters, like, it's such a great investment. It's such, I mean, think about the other things that you do, especially with your time. What do you gain 
And I know, look, this is a big thing. I'm going to keep on pounding it, you know, because it's in our culture. What do you gain by being on the internet, by being on Facebook and scrolling through? And how much time, think about that, time yourself sometime. How much time do you spend in a given day? Say, oh, but I only check just for a minute. How many times do you do that a day? And what is the value in that? And look, I've been on Facebook quite a bit, and I'm not saying you know, it's a sin to ever be on Facebook or anything like that. I know there's nothing good on Facebook. <laughs> okay, is, you might get a couple cool videos or an article or some news, but ultimately, it's a waste of time. I mean, let's just face it. Let's just face it. Just, just say, you know what? It's a, just a waste of time. And you know what? If you want to waste your time, go ahead and do it. But don't let that stand in the way of like you getting some, some actual good, something good to do, something, something that's going to help you. I mean, if you've got the time, that's how you want to spend your downtime of just kind of unwinding from the day or something, whatever. You know, I don't care what you do, but just, just weigh what's important to you. And when you're determining how much time you have in a day, Oh, I don't have time to read that many chapters of the Bible. Well, do you? Do, do, you, do you really not have time? 30 minutes listening to God? I mean, I think about my children. I don't, I don't know, you know, I've never really thought about this before, but quantifying how much they hear from me or from my wife. Just instruction, things to do, things they need to do today, things that, you know, like how much time are they hearing from us? as we're trying to raise them. Well, God's not going to give you an audible voice. He's given us his word. He's speaking to you. How much time, how much are you going to listen to what he has to say for you? And especially, you know, we go through problems, we have hard times, and it's like, I don't know why this is all going on, and, you know, but you're not listening to God. You're not listening to what he has to say. See, wisdom can be found. Wisdom wants to be found. We're still in Proverbs chapter 1. Look down at verse number 20. The question is, do you want to be wise? Because wisdom is readily available for you. Verse number 20, the Bible says, wisdom crieth without. And it does, crying doesn't mean weeping there. It means like shouting. Like wisdom is just shouting outside. Wisdom, it says, she uttereth her voice in the street. She crieth in the chief place of concourse. In the openings of the gates, in the city, she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? Ye ignorant people, how long do you just want to stay ignorant and just bask in your, in your lack of knowledge? That's what it means here. You simple ones, you love simplicity. And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. How long? Wisdom's right here. How long are you just going to close your ears and not want to have anything to do with it? Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. God wants to just pour out knowledge and his spirit and his understanding. He wants to give you all of that. Wisdom's available. God's not withholding that, but you need to be seeking it. You need to be ready to receive it and not just stopping your ears and loving your simplicity and, oh, everything's just great and I'm just going to go off and live my life in sin and not worry about what the Bible is. I'm just going to put this book on a shelf and just forget about it and just go off and do whatever and just be a simple one, be a simpleton and just, just be a fool in your simplicity. When God's saying, look, I'm trying to make you wise. I'm going to give you some understanding, but you just have to listen. You just have to receive a little bit of correction because you're wrong. You need to understand what I'm saying and receive God's word. It's there and it's there forever. Praise God. He's given us. He's, he's made his words available to us and so much the more even for us today in the year that we live in. The time that we live in. Think about how readily available God's word is today. That's probably one of the reasons why people don't treat it as precious as they ought to. You know, in, in years past, in, in centuries past, in millennia past, coming across God's written word was a little, a little bit harder just because of the, 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 the means of, of, you know, being able to write things down. And 
I'm not saying, I mean, it was, it was definitely available before, but now it's so cheap. I mean, you literally go to a dollar store. You could find, you could find a dollar in change on the ground if you walk around and up outside. You can find a dollar. You could get, find someone to give you enough money to, for a dollar. You could come into a church and get a Bible for free. You can take a dollar eight or whatever tax is and go to the dollar store and get yourself a Bible, or you could come in here and get one for free, and you just have your own completely bound, full Old Testament, New Testament Bible completely available. And most people aren't so poor that they, they don't even have one dollar. Most people, you know, I have my phones up there recording, but most people have these phones and you have apps and you can carry the Bible. I mean, think about the access to Bible that you just have all the time with you every single day. I mean, like every moment of the day, you just have access to God's word no matter where you're at. People haven't always had that. And not even just a capability to read. Think about it. You could listen to God's word. You could just have a recording. Who, who had that throughout history? Not many people. You can hear God's word just, just read out loud for you. So you don't even have to put the words in front of you. No, I recommend reading. I think it's something we all ought to do. I do it. But I also listen to the Bible. I'm in a car ride. What do I do? I listen to the Bible. We were in a car yesterday. We were running errands. What do we do? We turned the Bible on and the whole family listened to God's word just being read out loud. Why? Because it's available. It's easy. It's, there's so much there. And the Bible says, you know, to whom much is given shall much be required. And just keep that in mind because we've been given a lot. We have a lot of opportunity. And God's going to expect you to you, make use of that. Don't just, yeah, I don't want to do that. Eh, that's, that's not what I feel like doing. When you don't feel like doing these prayers, you don't feel, I don't feel like reading my Bible. You're walking in the flesh. Because your flesh doesn't want you to do those things. And look, I understand because I've had, I have those feelings too sometimes. Because the flesh is telling you don't do that. I know what it's like. Uh, I don't, you know, I'd rather just watch a documentary. I'd rather go and do something else. I'd rather go have fun. And I, you know, I don't really want to read my Bible. I'll do that later. I'll do that later. And then later just becomes never. Or becomes the next day. Or the next day. Or whatever. You need to discipline yourself to do this. It is a work. It's something that, that you need to work at. But when you make it a habit, when you make it part of your routine, part of your schedule, you have a dedicated time in your schedule that you do this, it's going to be a lot easier for you. Just like combing your hair, brushing your teeth, you know, getting dressed. You have a routine, I'm sure. Everybody, everybody does to some degree. Insert Bible reading into your routine. Put that in there into your schedule and do it at a time. The, the, I mean, besides the capabilities to read and to listen, think about even being able to do the searches. These apps will let you, and your computer app, your programs and stuff, you can, you can type in words and pull up every, every verse that uses this word on any subject. You want to know anything about a subject? You could, I mean, it's amazing. It's incredible. You have access to being able to learn wisdom in a way that only people who really knew their Bible were able to get before. I mean, really knew, you know, read, 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 read to be able to, to reference things. And because the more you read, the more you're going to remember, oh yeah, I remember hearing about this in Jeremiah. Oh, I remember hearing, reading about this in, you know, in James. Oh, I remember reading about this in Romans. And that's what reading is going to give you is that ability in your mind to be able to, to put things together. So as you're reading various parts of the Bible, oh, yeah, oh, okay, now I understand a little bit more because I, I remember reading this before. And when you're reading regularly, it's going to stay fresh in your mind. There's benefits. Turn if you go to Proverbs chapter 2. You're in Proverbs chapter 1. There's so many benefits Proverbs chapter 2, we're pretty much going to go through the whole chapter here. Proverbs chapter 2 has a lot of benefits. As I mentioned before, you know, I kind of just made the statement that, you know, with God's word, you're, it's, it's for your own benefit. Proverbs 2 lays out 
many of the reasons why. Let's start reading in verse number one. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, hide my commandments with you, just keep it with you, keep it in your heart, that, it, that, that knowledge stays with you, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures. Put it, that's putting a pretty high priority on wisdom and knowledge and attaining that, right? As much as you'd attain, oh, we're going to go on a treasure hunt. There's a million dollars worth of gold coins and it's buried somewhere in town here. We're going to spend all this time and energy and resources just to find that treasure. He's saying, if thou seek her as silver, talking about wisdom, talking about instruction, talking about understanding. It says, then, verse 5, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Seek for it, work for it, read after it. And then you'll find it. You'll get it. This is not something that you'll do in vain. God will give you that knowledge. God will give you the knowledge of God, the knowledge from God. That's valuable. God's, God's wisdom, God's knowledge being imparted unto you. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. A buckler is like a shield. It's a, it's a defense. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity. Yea, every good path. You get wisdom. You're going to understand the right way. You're going to understand, oh, this is the way I go. This is the right choice. That's the way. That's the path that I want to take. You're not just coming up to a fork in the road completely blindly. When you don't have God's knowledge, it's... Well, let's do this. And you're even more likely to, to look at the one, oh, this looks a little bit nicer, but it's the, the sin-riddled path. But when you have wisdom and knowledge, you can look at it and be like, oh, yeah, that's, that's actually not the right way to go. I'm going this way. You're going to know that because you're, you, you've received knowledge from God in order to know that. It's not something that's innate that everyone just knows. You need to be, you need to be taught that. You need to understand it. You need to learn every good path. Verse number 10. When wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. No, knowledge is pleasant. That's a, it's, not, it's not a chore to receive knowledge. It's not, it's not this big burden. Oh, we have to go to church again. Oh, I got to read my Bible. But it's actually pleasant. That's where you want to be. When wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee. It's going to get you through to get through unharmed or unscathed, shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. Look at verse number 12. To deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things. So the people are going out there and doing evil and wickedly. Hey, when, the more wisdom you get, the more knowledge you get, that's going to keep you from being a victim of the evil man. You're going to be able to spot it early enough to get yourself out of harm's way, to get yourself out. Of, this is very practical, is it not? Oh, I can't, you can't get that from the Bible. You need to be street smart. No, you get Bible smart, you'll be able to understand that. You'll be able to see characteristics of the evil man. You'll be able to understand the flattering of the lips. You'll be able to understand the things and the ways of the evil man and be like, this guy's wicked. And I don't care that I can't prove it to you with, with, with some crime that he's committed that I know about. I know that this person's wicked. I'm going to stay away from them. And that's going to keep you away from the evil man. You can jump down to verse number 16. Also, it's to deliver thee from the strange woman, right? The adulteress, the one who wants to ruin your marriage, the one who hunts for the precious life, the one who's out to destroy that which is wholesome and good because she's just wicked and evil and is just living for the flesh and just wants to do whatever and doesn't care about anybody or anything, is willing to destroy. Hey, getting this wisdom is going to keep you from that, keep you from that damage and just say, no, I'm not even getting close to that. I'm going to make up rules for myself. I'm going to make up boundaries. I'm going to set it up so that adultery never happens. And verse number 20, we're just going to jump down a little bit because each one, it kind of goes into a little bit more depth about the evil man, the strange woman. And then in verse number 20, it says that thou mayest walk in the way of good men 
and keep the paths of the righteous. These are all things that wisdom is going to do for you. Knowledge is going to do for you. When you're seeking wisdom as silver and, and, and you're going after that knowledge, this is just an example of the things in your life that, that this wisdom will benefit you. Walk in the, in the way of good men. Keep the paths of the righteous. For the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect man shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressor shall be rooted out. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 2. Obviously, the whole book of Proverbs, we read a lot about wisdom and knowledge and how important it is to keep instruction and receive all these instructions. I just want to, Luke chapter 2, I just want to point out something here. Luke 2, we, we read this, of course, last week on Christmas, the Christmas story. But it also covers a little bit about Jesus when he's growing up. This is actually the only place you're going to find Jesus being referred to as a child and what, and what happened with him. Now, the reason why we're going to this story is because, you know, Jesus Christ is the Word. He, his name is the Word of God. You get that from the book of Revelation. He is the Word of God. John chapter 1 says the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. You know, and, and, and then later on it says the word was made flesh and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father. Jesus Christ is the word. Jesus Christ is the living word incarnate, the word of God. We have the word of God here. What we need to hear from Jesus. And you can hear from Jesus himself through God's word. These are, these are his words. Not just the words in red. I mean, the Bible is the words of Jesus. It's the word of God. We're going to see just the wisdom of Jesus even from a young age here in Luke chapter 2. Look at verse number 42. The Bible says, And when he was 12 years old. Think about a 12-year-old child. Obviously, this is just, just demonstrating how different Jesus was. It says, They went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast, and when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors. Now, when it says in the midst of the doctors, we think of doctors as being like a medical doctor. But this is talking about doctors of the law, like lawyers or people who, who study, and it's God's law. These are doctors of 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 the scripture, of the Mosaic law. These, these are the people that he's sitting down and speaking with. People who have spent a lot of time and years in studying God's law. So that's who he's talking to, doctors of the law. In the midst of doctors, both hearing them and asking questions. So remember, he's 12 years old. He's not going around and telling everybody the way things are because when, Jesus, when God became flesh... He took on the limitations of a human being. So even Jesus Christ himself, when he was born, he didn't have all knowledge. He wasn't like speaking and able to speak other languages and do all this stuff as like an infant, as a newborn. Okay? He grew as a human being. Being God, having taken on limitations, he grew as a human being. And he grew, the Bible says there in verse number 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. Stature is just physically, like his, grow, his height, like he, he physically grew, and he grew in wisdom. It says, and in favor with God and man. So even though he was God in the flesh, he still was gaining wisdom. But what this is demonstrating is that even at the time of 12, what was he doing? He was seeking after wisdom. He was seeking, he was attaining unto wise counsels. He's, he's hearing people, right? He's not just, just, you know, shouting out, just telling everybody the way things are at 12 years old. He was listening. Because look what it says. It says they, they, they found him, it's by both hearing them, so he's listening and asking questions. Asking, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. But make sure you're listening, too. Right? I mean, hear. Hear what's being said. We hear what's being taught. You ask them about it. And when he was asking them questions, he says, and all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Jesus was seeking wisdom and knowledge while he was on this earth. And he got it. And, and uh, obviously by the time he started teaching then, 
when he was about 30 years old, he started teaching and, and telling everyone else. He had a lot of wisdom and a lot of knowledge. And he sought after it, and it was found, and it was given to him. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We want to look to God's word for this wisdom. And we want, to, we want to make sure it's a habit for us. And I'm just trying to demonstrate how important this is and how much this is really going to help you. And even people, I don't care if you have a learning disability. I don't care if you've never, you know, don't have um, formal education in your background. None of that's going to matter if you're simple now, if you don't understand that much, if you decide to dedicate your time and your energy and your effort to hearing and receiving wisdom from God, He will give it to you regardless of your background. It may be a little bit harder to get through if you, you, know, if you don't read quite as well, but He'll give it to you. It's, it's a promise. It's something that will happen. If you seek after that wisdom and you put your energy and effort into it, he'll give it to you. And it will make you smart. God's knowledge can, will, can be given to you. And that is the best knowledge to have. And that is going to help you in your life make the right choices and understand what God's will is and understand right from wrong, equity, judgment, all those things we read in Proverbs. It's going to help you with that. Act 4 is a perfect example of this. Act 4, verse number 13. The Bible says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Well, Peter, Peter and John in Acts chapter 4, what are they doing? They're going out and preaching because this is after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's gone. He's commanded them now, hey, you need to go forth and preach. And now they finally, after the day of Pentecost, everything's going on. Now they're boldly going out and they're preaching God's word. They're preaching knowledge. They're preaching wisdom. They saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. What does that mean? They didn't have an education. They didn't go to college. They're unlearned men. They're ignorant men. What? They were fishermen. Peter, James, and John. They were just in a trade. They were blue-collar workers. They're not these college grads. They're not going off getting these white college. You know, they're not dedicated to, to you know, being doctors of the law and everything else. They're ordinary guys. And he says, they were, they were astonished because they look at them. He says, they perceived that they're unlearned, ignorant men. And then they marveled. They were amazed. Like, what? Who are these guys being bold and preaching? And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. That's where they got the wisdom from. That's where they, they didn't just, it didn't just happen without any work being done. It's not like they plugged in and they, they got their download of all this knowledge. No, they had been with Jesus. They spent time with Jesus. They learned from Jesus. They listened to Jesus. They received instruction from Jesus and they stayed by him, thick and thin. And they just kept listening and they were consistent. Day in, day out. Every day ministering with Jesus, hearing from Jesus, receiving instruction from Jesus. That gave them the ability to be bold, to preach God's word, to teach others. Hey, are you listening to Jesus? Are you spending time with Jesus? Have you been with Jesus? I don't care what your background is. I don't care if you've never been to college. I don't care if you've only gone through the sixth grade in, in grammar school or whatever. If you've been with Jesus, if you spend time with Jesus and if you hear from him, He'll make you wise. He'll give you understanding. You can get smart. You could overcome whatever disability. You, you could understand these things, but you need to invest the time and, and just be with them, be dedicated to them. In Luke chapter 8, you could turn to Luke chapter 8 if you'd like. Let's go backwards a little bit. Luke chapter 8. There's a story here. Jesus is preaching to a bunch of people and then some people come up to him in, in Luke 8, verse number 20. 
It was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to see thee. So he's out, he's preaching his group of people, he's doing his work. And then someone comes up to him and says, Hey, Jesus, you know, your, your mom and your, your brothers and sisters, they're, they're here. They're here to see you. Right? And he's busy. He's working. And look at how he answers them in verse number 21. Luke 8, 21 says, And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. And that's cool. I mean, the people that, hey, they're listening, they're hearing the word of God, and they're doing it. Now, hopefully, you know, I'm, I'm talking mostly just about reading your Bible, getting Bible reading in. That's the goal for the new year. Hey, spend time, make the investment, get the goal, get a plan, and get your Bible reading set forth. But don't just, don't just read it. Do it. But apply it. Right? That, that's where you're going to really get the, 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 the understanding. The real understanding is when you say, okay, I've read this. Now I'm going to change. Now I'm going to do things that this says. That's the whole point. I mean, if you're not going to read your Bible to, to actually make changes and do it, then why even read it at all? <laughs> if you're not, not going to actually do anything different based on what it says. This isn't just some storybook, some, some fairy tale that, oh, that was from good reading. I'm gonna... No, this, this is designed to give you instructions and to help you change your life. But he says, my mother and my brethren are these. When you're listening to Jesus and doing his words, he, he, he looks at you like family, like close family, my, bro my mother and my brethren. And that's pretty cool. I mean, just, just remember that. And you can look at the endearment that Jesus gave to those that hear the word of God and do it. And how often, so how often are, are you hearing the word of God? I mean, think about that. My mother and my brother are these which hear the word of God and do it. In, in another place, there was, um, in Luke 11, there's, there's a lady who said, you know, blessed are the paps that thou hast sucked. You know, basically saying, oh, blessed be Mary. And he answers and says, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Jesus Christ himself said, you'll be blessed if you hear the word of God and keep it. You, you, you read God's word, right? You hear it. You, 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 you allow it to come in to you. And you keep it. You're going to be blessed. It's a blessing. It's a good thing. We need every word of God. Every word of God provides our sustenance. You don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to the 2 Timothy chapter 2. Last place I'll be turned, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, this is what Jesus quoted when the devil came and tempted him. Remember when the devil came and tempted Jesus and he said, hey, you know, because he was fasting in the desert. He was hungry and saying, hey, well, if you're really the son of God, why don't you turn this stone into some bread? And Jesus quoted scripture, which he wouldn't have been able to do if he wasn't reading and getting this wisdom. See, Satan's out there trying to deceive. Satan was out there trying to tempt and to deceive and to trick Jesus into doing something he shouldn't have done. But you know what Jesus knew? He had, he had wisdom. He had knowledge. Where was it from? God's word. Where was it from? The Old Testament, because he quoted Deuteronomy chapter 8 to him. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 3, the Bible says, And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. He answered Satan with scripture saying, no, 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 I'm not going to turn that into bread because man doesn't live by bread. We need the word of God. He said, we don't live by bread only. Obviously, our flesh needs sustenance. We said, well, we really need is the word of God. We need that. And you think about how often you eat. Well, how, compare that to how often you're, you're getting food from God. You're getting manna from God. Because that was what it, Deuteronomy 8, what he's re referencing is the manna. And if you remember, the manna was provided completely free to the children of Israel when they were out. They didn't have anything. God provided for them. All they had to do was go out, collect it every day, and eat it. And that sustained them. That gave them their strength, their energy, their food, what, you know, what they needed the whole time they were out in the wilderness. God provided that to them. And he said that the manna was to teach them 
that they don't live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth. Why? Because God promised to take care of them. And the manna was a fulfillment of that promise. And he said, hey, you just, just trust, trust God and understand, wow, if we just believe God, if we just trust God, if we just hear from God and we just listen to the words that God says, we'll be taken care of. That's what the manna was teaching them. And just as much as they went out and got that manna every day, we ought to be in our Bible every day, receiving the words from God because that's what we live by. That's what we should live by. That's what's going to give us life and the instruction and everything that we need. The daily devotional is not going to cut it. Reading your one verse or two verses a day or whatever it is, that's just not enough. I mean, is that better than nothing? Yeah, it's better than nothing. But you know how long it's going to take you to get through the whole Bible if you're only reading a couple verses a day? It's going to take a long time. I should have done the math on that. That's going to take you a long time. You need this way more than that. I mean, it's like if you just had a muffin every day and that's all you ate for the whole day, would that sustain you? I mean, think about how emaciated you'd be. That's all the food that you had for an entire day. Just one, one little thing, right? Just one, one small piece of food, just enough to give you, you know, just enough, right? You're going to be weak. You're going you're gonna to be hungry all the time. You're going to be going, you have a lot of problems as opposed to getting a healthy meal every day. And, and sustaining. That's what we, we need a healthy meal from God's word. Not just one or two verses, not just being on life support because we're just barely getting enough of God's word trickling in to, to, to get us through from day to day. No, let's, let's treat this as important as it is. Treat it as your, your daily food. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15 The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I'm gonna, I give you lots of examples of what I feel might be appropriate as far as goals or you know, how often we should be reading our Bible and stuff. But the Bible doesn't explicitly say, you need to read the Bible this much. Exactly. Like, you need to read through the Bible once a year, every year. And if you don't do that, you're in sin. The Bible doesn't tell you that. But you know what the Bible does say? It says this, study to show thyself approved unto God. So that, that, that gives you, the, put the ball in your core a little bit to say, well, what do I think is going to be approved unto God? What do I think is going to make God pleased? What's going to make God, what's he going to put his stamp of approval on? Me taking one minute of my time to read one verse and then close the Bible and just spend the whole rest of my day doing everything else and just giving God that one minute to hear from him? Do you really think, just honestly, that, that God is, a, yeah, I approve of that. You decide that for yourself. You, you could ask yourself that question. What do you think is going to be approved by God? That's how much you should be studying. And this is, just, this is studying. This isn't even just reading. Because, you know, there's different things that you get from the Bible. You read, you study, and you memorize. And those are all different things. And they, they, they kind of, they help you in different ways. Reading is going to give you overall just some, some basic knowledge and understanding. Studying is going to give you more in-depth on particular subjects and, and just studying more on particular areas and memorizing is committing it to memory and just keeping it in your heart and you meditate on it on one specific you know, short section or whatever and, and gaining wisdom that way. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Why? Because if you're studying, you're not going to be ashamed. When you're doing the work of the Lord, you won't be ashamed. You're not going to be embarrassed. That, oh, I don't know what the Bible says about that. Because when you're studying to show yourself approved unto God, you will know what the Bible says about all manner of subjects. And you will be able to provide answers and you will be able to help people out and you will be able to do those things like Peter and James and John who were just fishermen, but they stayed with Jesus. They heard from the word of God and they were able to go out then and help other people and heal people and provide instruction and wisdom and knowledge. Why? Because they, they studied to show themselves approved unto God. Rightly dividing the word of truth. 
not being mixed up in a bunch of false doctrine or coming up with these crazy ideas. No, why? Because they know the rest of the Bible. They know how to interpret things in context. They know how to rightly divide. They're not worried about what James chapter 2 says about faith without works is dead and going, oh no, is it work salvation? No, I don't know. Why? Why? Because they know all the, the scriptures. Because they, they've read enough and they say, no, of course it's not. That's not what that's saying at all. And I'm not going to be deceived into some works-based salvation because I know what the Bible says. If you actually want to know for yourself what the Bible says, then you have to invest the time to reading. That's the bottom line. No one else can do it for you. No amount of listening to sermons on YouTube is ever going to compare to your own reading and studying of the Bible for yourself. Just like the Bereans did in the book of Acts. They say, what do they do? They, 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 they searched the scripture daily, whether those things, they, they were hearing preaching. Hey, they were hearing great preaching from the Apostle Paul. I'm sure it was dynamic preaching. I'm sure it was exciting preaching. I'm sure there's lots of great truth packed in there. But you know what they did? They were searching the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. They were staying in the Bible and in the Word of God every day. That's our goal. That's what I want you to do. I want you to stay. No, no matter what your personal goals are for, for getting through the Bible, get in God's Word every day. It's important. Hopefully you can join us in this challenge in the, in the month of starting tomorrow. Read nine chapters tomorrow. You can do that so many different ways. Figure it out for yourself. You could split up four and five or whatever. You do some in the morning, some in the evening. Try reading the Bible every time you eat a meal. I mean, it's easy to do now. You got your phone with you. You could, you could be out at a restaurant and say, you know what, let's just read a couple chapters now. Let's read. Every time I'm eating, putting food in my mouth, I'm going to put spiritual food into my body. Why not? It's a good habit to form. And if it's, it's, it's something you just always do, great. I mean, not everybody does this, but we, we do. We ask for a blessing every time we eat a meal. It's a habit now. I can't even imagine eating without doing that. Well, why not add something else to that? Just read a chapter of the Bible. Or, you, know, what, you do these little things that will help you, and then getting through all this is not going to be that big of a chore or a task. You yeah, actually look forward to it. 31 days, whole New Testament. I am going to have a prize at the end of the month. If you complete the whole New Testament by January 31st, then you will, uh, you'll get that prize. Now, and, and now I am saying, no, it has to be reading, not just listening. We, we, you know, I listen to the Bible all the time, but I want, I want this, in order to, to earn this particular prize just within the church, then read, read the Bible. Pick it up and read it physically. I don't care if it's on your phone, but a <laughs> phone or a book, whatever. Read it, and, uh, and, and you'll earn that prize. But even more important, I mean, you'll have the New Testament already read just in the first month of January. That's going to help you out for the rest of the year. Let's bow our heads, have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction and the wisdom that you promised to give us, and that, that is just found right in these pages of this book, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to recognize how precious your words really are. Help us to treat it as such. Help us to, to make that an, an important part of our life and that we would, we would be willing to, to not do other things in our life just to make sure, no, I need to make sure that I'm hearing from God, that I'm hearing from Jesus, that I'm receiving wisdom because it's that important, because it's more important than Facebook. It's more important than video games. It's more important than even just reading some other novels, dear Lord. Help us to, to, to make that decision and to stick with it and to, to not allow other things to, um, to cause us to fail from hearing from you, dear Lord, but that we would treat it of utmost importance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.